So welcome everybody tonight to our fourth in our COVID-19 series. And tonight's program is going to be Telehealth and Nursing Perspective. I'd like to acknowledge uh, that this program is presented to you by NENIC and Boston Children's Hospital. They're our co-provider and I always like to give a shout out to their professional development department because without them uh, obtaining CE and putting these programs together would be, um, I don't think it would be possible. So we were really um, incredibly grateful for the support that they give us in uh, supporting nursing informatics. The speakers have no potential conflicts of interest there is no commercial support for this program. <laughs> I'd like to welcome Teresa Rincon, Director of Clinical Operations and Innovations uh, for Virtual Medicine at UMass Memorial Healthcare. Also Lisa Dutton, who's the Professional Development Manager of Ambulatory Nursing at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. And Laura McLean, who's the Nursing Program Director for Ambulatory Informatics at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. We're going to start off this evening's program with Teresa starting and then we'll segue into a presentation from Lisa and Laura uh, about halfway through. So welcome to all of our speakers. Thank you very much. And we look forward to this evening's program. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk a little bit about telehealth and uh, my experiences in telehealth. Um, and the objectives that I'll cover uh, this evening are describe the various applications of telehealth and I'm gonna go pretty far back in the, in the past and then bring us through to the present and talk a, a little bit about what's emerged um, with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And I wanna identify some of the benefits and challenges to delivering telehealth services. Um, and maybe hopefully you'll walk away with understanding some of those modifiable factors that influence adoption and the effectiveness of telehealth services and recognize innovations that can be used to deliver telehealth services that enhance access to timely and effective care. I like to actually really focus on the steep principles that came out and I'll talk a little bit about what that is in a minute and then review the use and impact of telehealth during the COVID-19 crisis at the UMass Memorial Healthcare. And when I talk about um, steep, that comes from the Air is Human report and I don't know how, how many of you remember that. I'm, I'm old enough to remember it, but it's interesting. Sometimes when I share these slides that people are like, what? The Air is Human report? It was in 1999. And basically it was a, it focused on, it was a report that focused on errors that harm. And at that point, there was an estimation of at least 44,000 to 98,000 Americans die in hospitals annually as a result of medical errors. And more recently, there was a study out of Johns Hopkins that um, estimated that 250,000 people in the United States die every year due to medical errors, while others claim the numbers to be as high as 440,000. There's a lot of disputes. If you look at editorials on those statistics, people will argue about the, the statistics of whether or not it's closer to 100,000 or really as high as 440,000. But whether we count deaths in tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands per year, it's too many. It's way too many. In the airline industry, they now count uh, deaths caused by accidents in the hundreds, not hundreds of thousands, hundreds. And they do, I think, 750 um, million um, airline uh, travelers per year, not lately because of COVID, but they do many more than what we see in hospitals in the United States. And that was just, just domestic, not international. And one of the things that came out of the Teera's Human Report is these focus on six aims for improvement. So many of you may have heard of this, even if you haven't heard of um, the Teera's Human Report, but safe, timely, effective care, better, safer care. There was different mottos that kind of came out um, of that, but really it's safe, timely, effective, efficient. This is the one that I think gets left out the most. And this is what I think informatic, informatics can help with is efficiency, equitable, and patient-centered care. I think that's the one that we could probably impact the most and the one that I focused on for most of my career. And what the Air, Two Eras Human Report asserted was that the problem is that there are good people working in bad systems, right? And those systems need to change. And I would like to assert that telehealth is one of the ways to change those, those systems. And that telehealth 
um, can be used in these five ways. They can bring expertise to, to all areas. So what we know is there's a disparity of expertise because there's been an explosion of information and no one person can know all. In fact, this is probably, this statistic I'm gonna give you is probably about a decade old, but to, to remain um, uh, 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 effective or to understand the, the evidence in the practice of internal medicine alone would mean that the provider would need to read about 18 hours a day. So there's no way to, to know it all. You just can't know it all. So we need better ways of uh, uh, spreading this expertise across vast areas. And telehealth can assist people with limited access to specialized care. Telehealth is practical, practical and relatively expensive for patients. It's less expensive many times than traveling to the hospital and having to pay parking and pay gas, or some people need to use public transportation or take a taxi or an Uber or something of that effect. And telehealth maximizes access to mental health care and telehealth benefits are set to grow. And I want you to focus on one thing here. This little piece in Health Tech was written in 2019. So this is before the pandemic, before now telehealth is what I call sexy. Everybody wants to do telehealth. They see the value in it finally, something I've been working on for many, many years. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that now when I look at this, when I take you through this very busy slide, I don't usually like busy slides, but I wanted to be able to show you a timeline of really kind of where the, the telehealth began. And you can see in 1905, I actually found an article for one of the papers I was writing um, that, that uh, was in, I believe it was a hospital journal in London, England. And it was a debate about whether or not phys physicians, doctors should be able to give telephone orders for medication because there was a, a error that occurred and a patient died. So in this particular piece, they were saying it should be forbidden to use the telephone for telephone orders. And we know that debate has raged on for years, but we still use the telephone. Not as much now that we have the electronic health record and CPOE, that's health, but there are instances where the telephone is used uh, for orders or other modes of telecommunication. And in 1906, the first EKG was transmitted across telephone lines. I don't know if you're aware of that. And this one appears it's hard to see this picture, but it's really the picture of a physician looking into what looks like a round monitor, computer monitor, and it's looking at a patient in bed at home, a child in bed at home. And this was envisioning what they called the teledactyl, which sounds kind of like a, a dinosaur, uh, but it is really what we're doing today, right, with telehealth and telemedicine. And when you look across here, you can just see more and more things that happened in Nebraska. Uh, there were hospitals that established the first interactive video link. NASA began to um, monitor using remote patient monitoring tools, monitoring the astronauts in space. And here, look at Mass General opening up that remote medical outpost at Logan Airport. I don't know how many of you knew about that in, in 1963. Uh, Norfolk State Hospital provided telehealth services. In the 1960s, uh, the DOD and the Department of Public Health and Human Services started doing behavioral health programs at Native American reservations using NASA equipment. And then you start to see the first telenursing articles published in the 1970s. Uh, MIT had the talking heads, which by the way is really weird if you ever go look at that. It looks very strange. Uh, it's like this head and that's all there is is a head talking. Kind of odd, but that was one of the first social presence um, activities that they got involved in. And then you saw the dawn of the internet. Oh my gosh, that's where it started to explode. And right after that in the 1990s, CMS said, well, hey, we should reimburse, especially rural areas. They're the ones that need telehealth the most. Now, now we know that's not true. It's not just rural communities. And healthcare shortage areas are not just in rural areas. There are cities that I know of in California where we had trouble recruiting physicians to work there because you couldn't park your car without it being broken into. So specialty physicians don't wanna work in places like Oakland or downtown LA. There were places where people just didn't wanna work and it was hard to recruit and these were in cities. 
And then we'll talk a little bit about the AACN and them establishing the CCRNE in tele-ICU in a moment. But that started about 2007, where you could use the hours you worked in a tele-ICU to, to renew. And by 2011, you could initially renew with your CCRNE. We saw the first wave of tele-ICUs opening here, and I was actually part of the first wave as a staff nurse. So I have been in the telehealth space and the tele-ICU space since January of 2003. So I've been doing this quite a while. Um, and then we saw the nursing guidelines and consensus statement that I will talk about. And then COVID, right? We have the pandemic and everyone wants to be involved now. This was one of the first research projects that I did um, specifically focusing on nursing practice. I did some other small uh, research projects on sepsis and using nurses in the tele-ICU to screen for sepsis that I'll talk about. But this was one where we actually got a grant from the American Association of Critical Care Nurses. We got the very first project impact grant. It's a small grant, it was $50,000, but it was enough to allow us to give people um, uh, gift cards for the AACN store if they participated in a, um, a two-phase study approach with an online survey, looking at nurses' perceptions of the intensive care uh, tele-ICU models and how it impacted their nursing. And I'm gonna talk to us a little bit about that. Ruth Kleinpel, Connie Barden, um, Mary McCarthy, uh, and uh, Becky um, Rufo, um, we worked on this study together. And what we were really trying to get is what do tele-ICU nurses do and how does it impact the nurses in the intensive care unit? And what we found were that uh, in this pie shape, it's the only one I'm gonna share here because I wanna cover a lot of content, that they do a lot of different things. They did um, vital sign trending monitoring, um, which I'll talk a little bit about. I don't like to use the word monitoring. I like to use the word surveillance and I'll talk about what that means in a minute. They also looked at um, facilitating uh, medical management. So really working closely with the intensivists that worked with them in the tele-ICU to be uh, that facilitator to make sure patients got the right care at the right time. And another big focus was uh, catching physiologic um, instability or detecting it um, when it was going to happen. And sometimes really before the patient crashed because of the tools that we had. And then just in general, enhanced uh, patient safety. This is what we gleaned from talking to over 1,200 nurses. We actually only needed 350 nurses to participate, and we ended up with over 1,200 nurses who participated in this particular instrument. It was a validated instrument. And arrhythmia detection. So those were kind of the high key points when we started to examine what does a tele-ICU contribute to critical care? And from there, then we have the consensus statement that was first um, initially was a, um, a, a guideline paper that came out in uh, our uh, statement in 2011, I believe. And I, got, I was fortunate to be an expert reviewer um, on these guidelines. And then more recently as a consensus statement describing that tele-ICU nurses are critical care nurses who use technology to participate in nursing care for patients and that they're experts with advanced knowledge, situational awareness, um, and they possess advanced skills in communication, collaboration, mentoring, surveillance, decision-making, system thinking, and the use of technology. And in that, we did talk a little bit about different ways in which tele-ICU nurses impacted the care of patients. And the one that I helped lead in uh, Sacramento, California, in the tele-ICU there was sepsis surveillance. And as far as I can tell, we were the first nurses in the world to screen patients remotely using um, telecommunications and telemedicine tools and um, electronic uh, health records uh, and different health information systems. So we had vital sign monitoring that we could look at waveforms. We had lab integration. We could uh, also uh, go in the room with the camera. Um, we had vital signs that would trend over into trend views and clinical decision support tools. So we know that uh, sepsis is a leading cause of death globally with more than 5 million deaths annually and more than 31 million sepsis cases. And it's very expensive with more than 24 billion annually in the United States alone. And that every hour we delay, there's a 4% increase in death, but it's difficult to define. It's really a highly complex syndrome that makes it very difficult to detect. 
And the definitions keep changing, which is what I did my dissertation study on, and I won't talk too much about that today. But we know that it's very complex and it's difficult to get new um, nurses familiar with screening and identification, and even nurses who've been a nurse for a long time if they haven't spent a lot of time understanding and learning the pathology. And so from the Center Health experience, we as tele-ICU nurses saw sepsis as a phenomenon of concern in our health organization. We saw that there was no one really screening patients for sepsis at all. Uh, they weren't identifying them in a timely fashion and they weren't following the new sepsis bundle at that time that had come out um, in, 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 um, after a study with Manny Rivers and Bryant Nguyen in 2003. And we had adopted at many of the hospitals the order, same exact order set they used, but we weren't following it. So we initially tried to train hundreds and hundreds of inpatient and emergency department nurses, and we finally figured out we really needed to come at it from a knowledge management conceptual framework. And what that means is we would use knowledge management, which focuses on acquisition, sharing, translation, and application of knowledge. And in, in knowledge translation, which can also be referred to as knowledge brokers, um, they're used to close the gap between knowledge and practice in order to improve adherence to evidence, to get better outcomes, and to improve clinician effectiveness. So we said, why don't we take this core group of tele-ICU nurses, we have them right here, they're experts in critical care, let's train them to be sepsis experts. And that's what we did. And what we found is that a centralized remote team of expert nurses um, using a software application that we designed uh, with, our, um, with some help from our IS department um, could identify and advance clinical decision-making for sepsis patients. They could assess patients for sepsis upon admission to the ICU and every 12 hours because it was a manual process using a smart form. Um, we could influence repetitive, continual, and routine diffusion of evidence-based practices at multiple hospitals in a large health system. And we could collect data. This form, as again, I said it was a smart form. It actually was tied first to a Cognos database and later to Crystal Data reporting. And so we could uh, 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 not only document the incident, but report on the incidence of sepsis and compliance to the bundle throughout our health organization. And um, we were able to, to show with Apache data, which is the um, acute physiology age chronic health evaluation tool, the gold standard for critical care acuity scoring. We were able to show that we were having improvements in outcomes, but people didn't believe it because it didn't match the ICD-9 and 10 code data. So then we did a quick, we did a study uh, that I designed with a statistician at Sutter Health, as well as a, um, the medical director, Dr. Adam Seaver, um, and we put together this uh, study where we looked at pre and post um, uh, a, uh, uh, a program where not only did we monitor, screen, and collect data uh, on it, but we added the physicians writing a templated note in our um, electronic health record at the time, which was, I can't remember what it was. It wasn't even um, a, uh, a mainstream one. But we used that uh, template to write an order so that the code, and we, we went and met with the coders and we trained the coders on what to look for and made sure they agreed with the documentation. And when they saw that, that particular note, they would choose the appropriate diagnosis. And so we looked at an improvement and saw statistically significant improvements and, and increases in our ICD-9 uh, codes for severe sepsis and septic shock and we saw reductions in mortality that matched the, the data that we were seeing in the analysis using the Apache data. And one of the things that around that time I started to learn in my graduate studies, I did my PhD at the University of Kansas, was this um, framework or science around human factors and ergonomics. And I thought this was a good quote. Um, anytime Peter Proveno says we should do something, I, uh, most people in critical care stand up and say, hey, that sounds pretty good. Um, but human factors and ergonomics must play a more prominent role in healthcare if we want to increase the pace in improving patient safety. And so this is something I latched on to in the third chapter of my dissertation, which was a publication um, dissertation. I published an article looking at the design implications of a sepsis alert used by tele-ICU nurses, and I did a human factors evaluation. 
And so we began to look at that and we use those to really talk and oh, I forgot, I gotta tell you what surveillance is because I'm mentioning it now. So surveillance is very different from monitoring because it's defined as the purposeful ongoing collection, interpretation, synthesis, and analysis of individual patient or population data with the purpose or goal to support clinical decision making. Monitoring, we put people on monitors all the time, right? But what's the goal? What do we do when the alarm goes off? What does it mean? So surveillance is a little bit different. And I wanted to actually use the quotes because Beth Henneman, who's my co-author in this particular paper, wrote that and she is the queen of surveillance. I don't know how many of you know her. She works over at the Amher UMass Amherst campus. Um, and also what she said about surveillance is it's the dissemination of or acting on these data and that we can reduce morbidity and mortality and improve overall health in three ways. Through early warning of impending clinical or public health emergencies, documentation of impact of interventions, and tracking the progress towards specific healthcare goals. So surveillance, a different concept, some are familiar with it, some are not. And so as I began to analyze um, why is sepsis so difficult to detect? What makes it so hard for nurses to screen for sepsis? And well, at that time, early on, there was no big group of people saying sepsis was uh, something that we should do. There were no policies. There was no real public awareness until we know of the young, um, the child that died in New York and then it became very prominent and New York was the first state to actually put regulation around screening. But that wasn't going on at the time. That was like 2004, five, six, when we were developing our process in, in Sacramento, California. Um, there were no economic real incentives. No, nobody had published the big paper saying we're using tw losing $24 million a year because we don't uh, uh, take, uh, we have so many patients with sepsis and and we don't care for them appropriately using evidence-based practice. But we also know there's so many things that when we are doing anything, when we're analyzing any information that impact our ability and our sensory awareness, our physical environment. We were talking just now about temperature, when it's too hot or too cold, some of us don't think as clearly. Uh, the workplace layout, ventilation, distractions, lighting, noise, you know, all of those as an informaticist we have to be aware of. The social environment is their teamwork, uh, group norms, empowerment, does leadership support this? How's the communication process? Tools and resources, am I on a paper charting? At that time, most of the sites that we were dealing with were. Um, are there screening tools in place or not? What's the staffing like today? Um, do we have novice nurses? Do we, did somebody call in sick and we're shuffling for staff? We floated people to the units, equipment, devices, alarms, the nature of the work, how complex is it, competing tasks, sensory stimulation, cognitive requirements, physical requirements, and then alertness from that individual side, alertness, fatigue, problem solving, situational awareness, knowledge and experience, competency, motivation, skills and aptitude, and then that working memory. So, so many things. So we really started to look at cognitive processing and used a cognitive task analysis approach to look at how did nurses screen? We had over 5,000 patient cases and we knew exactly what they picked, what surge criteria they picked, what, uh, what uh, infection they thought the patient was here for or suspected, and what the organ failure was. So we knew the variables to put into the algorithm, but we wanted to think about how did they filter through that information. So we used cognitive um, uh, analysis to look at that. We also thought about human, human information processing, things like um, hazard matching, um, if we created an alert, what, what would it look like? And, and, and should it be prominent? And, and we actually created an alert that uh, said the word sepsis in it in red letters, in big, bold red letters. And uh, where will we put it? We, we worked with the nurses to find out where would they want it to be in the record, the health record, the electronic health record that they used. And what we know with alerts and the reason we needed to do this as we thought about it was that biomedical devices can produce as many as one critical alert every 92 seconds with less than 15% being clinically relevant. Now, I almost showed you a video right now, but I'm going to challenge you to go to it. So the IHI and the University of um, UCSF, there's a video out there on alert. So if you put alert fatigue um, IHI or UCSF, if you haven't seen that video, it's powerful. 
and they talk about the alerts in their electronic health record that were going off. And the physicians were getting about 30,000 alerts a month. And the pharmacists were getting 160,000. And uh, they ended up missing uh, uh, an overdose, uh, too much of a medication given to a child. They, they blew by the alerts because they were getting too many. But it's, it's powerful. I, I, I uh, encourage you to, to listen to that video. But what we found was that screening for sepsis is an intensive process. It's complex. And it uses a lot of uh, cognitive processing and working memory. And that expert nurses working in a controlled environment with a specific role to observe and respond to clinical alerts may enhance appropriate responses. Because from those data I told you about, we created this alert. And then human factors engineering can support system designs that control for and enhance the latent contributors that I talked about uh, that contribute uh, to um, severe sepsis identification. And I'll talk through this one kind of quick because I want to give time, of course, for our other speakers. Uh, one of the more interesting ones that we did recently is we looked at exemplars, another um, study that I did with Ruth Kleinpel, and it was really more of a qualitative approach to getting seven different health systems together and have them answer questions. And then from those questions, we distilled the information down to look at how were advanced uh, practice providers being used within critical care teams with I tele-ICUs. And what we, um, these were the seven um, health systems that we looked at. We had a Bay Care Health System down in Florida, Emory Health in Atlanta, Intermountain Health, which you can see are over here. It's kind of hard, to, might be hard to see the colors. Uh, Northwell Health, Oshner, which is down, um, down in Louisiana, UMass, of course, because I'm there. Uh, we got some nurse practitioners and PAs to participate, and then the Veterans uh, Medical Center, which covers uh, a wide range of states and have now implemented tele-ICU. And so what we found is that some worked in both the originating site, which is where the patient is, and the distant site, which is the remote monitoring um, or surveillance area. And some only worked in the originating site. They really worked, worked as the knowledge translators or bro knowledge brokers and help to facilitate the relationships between the ICU and, and the tele-ICU. Um, and that they worked, uh, took care of patients in many different areas. Um, so the ones that did not work in the distant site, um, we did include that because that's the telehealth services were just being provided in the ICUs or the acute care hospitals. But the nurse practitioners could be providing care or PAs and ICUs, EDs, rapid response teams on the acute care floor, SNFs, home, uh, so, uh, um, and long-term care, other long-term care facilities. And they did a variety of things based on licensure and what they were able to do in those states independently versus under supervision. So that's an interesting paper uh, to read if you're interested to see how advanced practice providers are being used. I'm going to quickly just go through this at a glance. This is a great resource here that you can go to. I'm sure these slides will be provided. But this was in February, right before the pandemic hit. And this is what we were seeing in uh, Medicare programs that reimburse for remote patient monitoring. It just hit. Uh, we had 16 different Medicaid programs that would reimburse for different varieties of telehealth. Uh, 50 different states had some form of telehealth occurring in their states. Uh, and of those uh, 50 states, most of them had some form of reimbursement for live video, although Massachusetts has continually lagged behind. Um, and then 19 states um, re reimbursed for services to the home. Um, and then COVID hit, right? And what happened when COVID hit? Well, now all of a sudden, everybody, even the CDC is saying, hey, use telehealth. This is a great way to promote social distancing and to make sure we expand access to essential services during the pandemic. And so did the Health and Human Services. Hey, we're even going to make HIPAA flexible. You can use FaceTime, which I don't recommend, by the way. I don't, I don't recommend any, using anything that doesn't have high, secure, um, high security involved in it. But hey, we were in the middle of a pandemic. We used what we could use. Um, waivers from different for, the, for uh, CMS for what they would pay for cost sharing, billing and reimbursement change. You can go to this website as well and read all this information about what can be done now due to the pandemic. And then editorials were out and they were saying, hey, outpatient visits in various settings, 
um, can be done effectively from distance. The infrastructure for connectivity is widely available because there was a lot of work over the last 30 years, I don't know if you know this, on uh, improving broadband throughout the United States. So by and large, many, many areas. In fact, cities are where we see the worst. We literally had to have um, uh, in some cities across the United States, hotspots, mobile hotspots would come in so kids could do their school, right? We'd say the mobile hotspot's gonna be in your neighborhood. This was in California, by the way. They're gonna be in your neighborhood um, on such and such you know, day at this time so that the kids could tune into school because they didn't have internet in some of our cities and where our, our poor people are. Um, the necessary training where needed, staffing and workflow development can be implemented rapidly with minimal disruptions or dis dislocations. I, you know, I kind of waver on that one. I'm not sure that's so, so true and I'll show you why in a minute. Uh, little or no resistance is encountered because of the pr protection for providers and patients. And this, we did see that. Uh, government um, has relaxed all restrictive regulations for telemedicine deployment, including interstate licensure, yes and no, uh, data confidentiality issues, and mostly, most significantly reimbursement, which we did see. So I'm not gonna, I don't want you to read this. I just want you to, to show you that I did conduct before uh, uh, the CDC and HHS were saying do telehealth. I actually was trying to promote this in the very first week and in the command center and I couldn't get, I, only, I got one, the nurse of course in the command center would listen to me, but the other person, I won't say who they were, wouldn't listen to me and I said, hey, we need to start thinking about doing telemedicine right now, telehealth right now, this is the answer. And I did the fishbone diagram to, to show um, kind of where some of the failures would be, which would lead us to why well, you do that. And I did that in March and like the first couple of weeks in March, I think it was March 12th, I was trying to get them to look at a report that I put together with my AVP with little to no success. But by April now they had figured it out and I began to examine what we were doing and how we were doing it. And I did a SWOT analysis and I found that our resource capacity planning was poor prior to the crisis. We actually had a department in virtual medicine, four people, myself, the director, the AVP, and they finally let us hire May of last year. They let us hire a, a, a system analyst and a project manager. That was it. I actually went to them and said, hey, we don't have enough appropriately skilled resources. At the same time I was doing this and I said, why don't you give me these three consultants? I know them. Two of them are nurses. They have knowledge like I have. They've deployed telehealth solutions. Let's bring them in. Uh, and then there was one technical. Oh, you don't need those people. We have all of these displaced workers. So we ended up training them all and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, schedules and deadlines were unrealistic. I'm sure you guys found that. I mean, heck, it's a pandemic. This stuff happens in a pandemic. Um, resources were assigned inconsistently. We give you resources, we take them away. Too many unplanned requests for uh, resources and tools, shifting resources uh, to, to respond to problems and then role and scope creep abounded. The strengths going into it was we had a vision to be the best place to give care and get care. We, established, we already had an established foundation for telehealth. We had established relationships and contracts with two telehealth vendors. We wanted to, as an opportunity, to be the provider of telehealth and telecommunications in Central Mass uh, and beyond, and telehealth is now mainstream. And then the, co the threats, of course, with the COVID uh, crisis, uh, forcing us to act too fast, the competition for hardware, software, human capital, and other health systems that were rapidly experiencing um, and getting experience in telehealth services. So we created some SMART goals. I'm not gonna read them all because I'm gonna show you the data real quick. We did a lean reproducible plan that included training support and deployment. Uh, and we implemented telehealth technologies throughout the health system in three to four week period. We stood up a telehealth support center in two weeks, which I personally trained um, folks that were transformation specialists and a couple IT people on all they needed to know in order to support people on the phone. We engaged our support center group and uh, created knowledge articles for them. We created a dashboard with data, which I'll show you some of the data in a moment. We used lean and qualitative approach to collect and analyze the adoption of telehealth. And we work and continue to work with our government relations um, uh, person, Jim Leary, to address some of the important state level barriers. Um, as you guys are probably aware, provisions uh, uh, for payment parity, state licensure, and credentialing by proxy. So real quick, here's some of the data. So you can see here, this is in the first couple weeks of March. And then after we started to deploy and train, 
We got up to about 1,800 telehealth sessions um, um, a week and peaked out at uh, around here. And what we did, uh, and you can see the groups here, our behavioral health specialist, which is our community health link and psych, remained the largest users of the service. They, they latched on really quick. Um, and when we look at um, a data in another source that uh, in this source, people could be using, uh, the first one I showed you was a particular vendor that we use for telehealth services. This one that they were documenting their number of appointments or visits using video visits, and they could be using any number or variety of uses uh, for doing a video visit, uh, but it was that they documented that they did it. And you can see we were hitting well over 4,000, close to 5,000 a week at one point. Um, but then we had to say, well, how there, we saw there were still a lot of people doing telephone visits. I didn't show you those data because I want to get through this. But um, we decided we would do a qualitative um, review using a focus group. Uh, and we had already been doing some focus group work using um, uh, optimization meetings. And so we said, let's, um, uh, we had come up with a model. I'll show you in a minute. And then we recorded the focus group sessions and we transcribed those. Uh, we'd already taken notes on the optimization huddles that started occurring immediately and throughout uh, uh, April and May. And then we did these focus group sessions. We had specific points uh, um, that uh, the focus group transcriptions were added into categories um, or themes. And then we reviewed the four people who were involved, reviewed each of those key points and coded and grouped and counted, and we rated those. And we had multiple reviewers to categorize and rate. And the people who we, we had over 30 caregivers who participated, and they were everything from inpatient hospitalists to primary care to so, uh, social workers uh, in psych and EMH, our community health link, which is a variety of psychologists, social workers, um, and others that, that work with them in physicians, ENT, pediatrics, pulmonology, critical care. So it was inpatient and outpatient. And when we look at the INSEP model, it was very similar to what I showed you with the influencers of adoption. There was individual components, the nature of the work, the social leadership support, the tools, which everybody initially thought, oh, it's the tool's fault when things don't go right. But there's so many other things that we know impact adoption and the external payment parity, physical lighting, many of these, as you look at this slide I talked about, is really building upon my work that I had done in my graduate studies and my dissertation work. And some of the things that when we put this into a Kano model, so if some of you might be familiar with the Kano model, it's K-A-N-O, and it really looks at everything from poor performance to good performance, to high satisfaction to low satisfaction. And what are the basic expectations? What would help me perform even better if you gave it to me? And what are the delighters or, hey, this would be a bonus. And what they really said, what we heard loud and clear, was that people wanted something simple, reliable, and accessible, easily accessible. And it needed to have quality of a network connection, which we can't always control. Patients and care providers needed to have compatible equipment and equipment that they were familiar with. And that the patient um, could not be physically or cognitively impaired. That could impact their ability to participate. And that you really needed interpreter services and integration. Some of the performance things was it could clear streamlined workflows that integrated technology smoothly, tech savvy, patient caregiver, payment parity, pre-visit, post-visit, accessible training, ease of documentation, clear expectations and accountability, appropriate patient selection. And the bonus was, I don't want to download an app. I want to, I want my, I don't want to download it. I don't want my patients to have to download it. I want them to click a link and be in a room. Um, and the vendor that we're going with today does not have that functionality, unfortunately. So it's a good thing it was just a delighter <laughs> and not a must have uh, waiting room functionality and integrated with the electronic health record with questionnaires and others. So we wanna make sure that we keep doing some of the things we have done, which was provide uh, a simple and reliable platform. Um, we do have that today. We have two different platforms that they can pick from using clear and consistent timely messaging, more staff support and training. Um, and I'm gonna kind of keep going here, but these slides will be available for you to look at. Um, the main thing I wanna say is this is what we wanna stop doing. We want to make sure that we narrow it to one or two. 
saying use whatever you want was not as satisfier. It was confusing for our providers. So it would have been better if we said, these are the two platforms we support and we'll help you use them. Mixed messages and then making sure we reduce the complexity. So I wanna kind of end here. Um, one of the fundamental fail points that I see in healthcare's approach was I thought articulated very well uh, in this Armstrong Institute for Patient Safety and Quality report from John Hopkins Medicine. And it said, urging clinicians to try harder or be more careful will not safeguard them against errors. It's crazy talk. It's really crazy talk. And likewise, efforts to improve care solely through education often have minor and fleeting improvements, if any. So to reduce and prevent such harms, the healthcare environment must be designed without human limitations and abilities in mind. It has to be blown up and completely redesigned, in my opinion. These are a couple additional uh, references that you can go to. I added the other references within the slides that you can go out to and refer to um, as uh, you would like to.